Well, good morning. Welcome to Montgomery Evangelical Free Church. We're seeking to reach across the aisle, across the street, and across the globe with the love and truth of Jesus Christ. It is Father's Day, and so we want to say Happy Father's Day to you fathers out there. We have a special video for you right now, and enjoy, please. So what does it mean to be a dad? I mean, at its core, what does it mean to be the best dad you can be? I mean, a dad's dad. Found you. Sometimes being a dad means you play hide and seek before breakfast. You're so easy to find. Maybe because I'm three times your size. <laughs> you know, there's more to being a dad than grabbing a mini and wearing socks and sandals and telling bad jokes. Don't talk with your mouth full. Hey, I taught you that. Go wake up your brother, would you? You know, being a dad isn't easy. It's like being under a constant job evaluation with managers who are much, much shorter than you. So we should strive to be the best dad we can be, because being a dad is a gift and a privilege. It's not an inconvenience or a burden. Now, lawn care, that's a burden. So let me tell you some things I've learned along the way. Ryan, it's time to get up, buddy. Kids need you to be present. They spell love, T-I-M-E. If you get a chance to jump on the trampoline, go jump on the trampoline. It's not gonna kill you. Mm, probably. Be your kid's biggest encouragement. I love to catch my kids doing something great, and I love to be intentional about letting them know that I noticed. And here's another one. Love when it isn't easy. Excuse me. Excuse me. And even when they're being annoying, I try to be slow to anger. Do I do it perfectly? You bet I do not. Not even close. That's why it's important they're not number one. Right, champ? Mm. He's still asleep. It needs to be obvious that my relationship with God comes first. And through that relationship, I can gain wisdom and strength and perspective. So don't sweat it. We all mess up. I know I've messed up a lot, and that's OK. The key is when you mess up is to ask for forgiveness. Because that's what a real dad does. Oh and the jokes. Got any new ones? Yeah, did you hear the one about the pizza? It's probably too cheesy. Don't forget about the cake. <laughs> Hi, Dad. I love it when you play basketball with me. I love how you can throw random foods together and it always tastes good. I love that you're the most hardworking person I know. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day. Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad, and to all the other dads out there. My favorite memory with my dad is when he packed my car up and helped me move across country to Arizona. It was an awesome experience. We got to see a lot of cool things along the way. He got to go to the Grand Canyon with me, and we even got to go to a NASCAR race. So, Dad, I just want to say Happy Father's Day, and I love you so much, and I miss you, and I hope you have a great day. Happy Father's Day! I love you, Dad! I love my dad because he is a great example of what a Christ-like father should be. Uh, he's loving, hardworking, <laughs> strict, but with a lot of grace uh, when I screwed up. And I just hope that I can be half the father uh, that he was for me. I love my dad because he always makes sure I have what I need when I need it. Uh, my favorite memory with him is going to soccer. Uh, one thing my dad always says to me is, don't ask stupid questions. Happy Father's Day. I love when my dad plays games with me. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, Dad. My three adult children and their spouses my Mercedes has not arrived yet, but I'm sure it will be here by the end of the day, so I will wait patiently for it. Thank you very much. We continue to reach out to you with our virtual classes, and on the 28th, we will start with a new class, and that is Biblical Shepherding in the Body of Christ. Uh, Joel and I will be co-teaching this class. It'll be 11.15, so you can make it after our outdoor service. I want to talk about shepherding and how to do it so that we can shepherd one another 
be one another's helper, comforter, guidance in the midst of the body of Christ. Four-week class, and there's an eight-week class, on the 10-week class, I'm sorry, on defending your faith on Monday nights at 7 o'clock, and Bill McGowan will be taking that. We are going to outdoor services on June 28th. We will still have virtual uh, church at 10 o'clock, but at 9.30 outside, we'll have outdoor services. We'll have singing with masks. More information can be gained on our website, but we're very excited to offer that. Right now, we're limiting it to 100 people just so we can get going. That's what the law says. We hope to open it up to more than that as the law opens up. I'm excited that five churches so far, and hopefully seven soon, are going to join together for a multi-church prayer day, a day of prayer for our nation in the midst of all of its troubles and conflict right now. And here's how it works. You will be sent the prayer sheet. You can pray whenever you want, morning, noon, night. You can pray with your family or by yourself. And all of these churches are banding together to join in prayer. Uh, there will be no formal gathering of the churches, but we'll be together in spirit on that day. Uh, our first men's outreach, uh, July 11th, the men's Frisbee golf, 10 a.m., Bunker Hill Road. I've played on that course. It's a great course right through the woods. Looking forward to have a good time at that, July 11th, 10. And then if you're new to the church, if you'd like to know more about our church, we'll have a virtual class or maybe an outdoor class. We'll see. The pastor's welcome class on July 12th at 7 p.m. If you're interested in that, please uh, see me, uh, e my email address, let me know you want to come. I'd love to tell you more about the history, the doctrine, and the vision of MEFC. Love to do that. I want to give you a call to worship. Our theme this morning is on the idol of elitism and the practice of partiality. Listen to how God is a non-partial God. Revelation 7, 9 through 12. I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out in loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All tribes, all people, all nations. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we think about heaven, as we think about how you have called people from every tribe, from every culture, uh, gender, educational ability, Father, you have called us to be your children, and there's equal footing at the cross. We want to thank you for the amazing grace of God. Let us sing to you now in spirit and in truth. Amen and amen. One day, all of us, no matter our position, our prominence, or our power, will bow our knee to the Lord of the universe. We can strive to be the best, the brightest, the fastest, or the smartest, but if we don't acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord, all our earthly striving has no heavenly merit. He is Lord of all. He has been exalted to the highest place and given a name that is above all names. He is the only thing that matters in this life and for eternity. Praise him with us.
What is in a name? To the artist, his name is the one altogether lovely. To the builder, his name is the sure foundation. To the doctor, he is the great physician. To the geologist, he is the rock of ages. To the sinner, he is the Lamb of God who cleanses and forgives sin. To the Christian, Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. His name is all we need.
In the book of Colossians, chapter 2, verse 7, the Apostle Paul exhorts us with these words. He says, Let your roots grow down into Christ, and let your lives be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Lord, in the midst of this tumultuous season in our country, in our world, a season of pandemic, a season of social unrest, a season of appeals for justice, would we, as your church, build our lives upon Christ, our rock? as the Apostle Paul exhorts us in Colossians 2. Fill our hearts with praise and thanksgiving this morning. Thanksgiving to you for who you are, creator, sustainer, savior, redeemer, and friend. Thanksgiving for what you've done for us, getting us up this morning, giving us our daily bread, providing a community of faith for us like MEFC, drawing us to yourself through the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ in our place. I want to take a few moments now and allow you to give God your thanksgiving and your praise and then I will close this prayer. So a few moments of silence, just in your hearts, praise the Lord and thank him.
Lord, even at a time like this, there is no shortage of reasons to praise your name and thank you for your mercy and grace. Give us hearts that proclaim your praises day after day, for you alone are worthy. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Our scripture reading for, from this, uh, for this morning is taken from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and I'll be reading from the New Life version. My Christian brothers, our Lord Jesus Christ is the Lord of shining greatness. Since your trust is in him, do not look on one person as more important than another. What if a man comes into your church wearing a gold ring and good clothes, and at the same time a poor man comes wearing old clothes? What if you show respect to the man in good clothes and say, come and sit in this good place? But if you say to the poor man, stand up over there, or sit on the floor by my feet, are you not thinking that one is more important than the other? This kind of thinking is sinful. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. We are moving through our series, Smashing Idols. And I've been so pleased to see many of you writing to me or writing to someone and saying, this has been very helpful for you to understand why you do what you do is to understand why you love what you love. Because we go where our heart goes. Idols, as we have said, are what capture our hearts. Idols are what captures our heart, and what captures our heart captures us. Think about it. Why do we spend our money where we spend our money? Because something in our heart wants us to do that. Why do we focus our time and energy where we do? Because something in our heart wants us to do that. What if our heart is polluted? What if our heart is running after the wrong thing? So understanding our heart as best as we can, allowing the Lord to shine his light on our heart, is the best thing we can do to grow as a Christian. We're talking about idols, and today I want to talk to you about the idol of elitism and the sin of partiality. The idol of elitism and the sin of partiality. Now, I'll explain those terms in just a moment, but let me go back to the illustration, the Bible passage that Joel just read. It's from James chapter 2, and you just heard it, but let me go through it again. One person comes into your church and He's got the gold ring and the nice suit and none of it's imitation. He's all that and you can't help but think, wow, what a great addition this would be to our church. Unfortunately, it was a sin back then. It's a problem in any church. The, the rich might be shown favoritism over the poor. And so you say to the man, look, don't just sit anywhere. The pew's not good enough for you. We have a special seat for you. We, we have a special place for you because you are much more important than anyone else. Conversely, what if a poor man come in, comes into your church? Uh, what if he's poor because he was born poor? What if he was poor because of financial reverse or health or sickness problems? What if he was just that way? And what if he came to your church? What if he was seeking help in some way and you said to him, no, 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 the, the pew's not good enough for you. You need to stand or worse yet, you need to sit on the floor. Do you think he'd come back? Do you think he'd see the love of Christ in our church if that's the way we treated people? Do you think he would say, oh, this is the good news of Jesus Christ. This is it. James 2.4, Joel read, Are you thinking that one person is more important than another? That kind of thinking is sinful. Let me define my terms, okay? Elitism is an attitude of superiority that lifts you up while demeaning others. Demeaning others. 
It lifts you up while demeaning others. Okay? It lifts you up. It is a false mindset. It is a false judgment. It is based on ungodly thinking. It is not something that comes from the heart, the character, the plan, the grace of God, as you will see. So it's superiority that lifts you up while putting down others. It's an attitude. Partiality is the action. Partiality is the demeaning of others by not treating them equally. By not treating people equally, you demean other people. Now, why do we do that? One sociologist says, it is part of our nature and our lust for power to make ourselves feel better by individualizing ourselves and just lumping other people together, dehumanizing them and stereotyping them. And so we look good as individuals. They look bad as a mass. And we do that. And we shouldn't do it because, again, it's against the will of God. The gospel breaking down all sorts of walls between people. And the wall that I just spoke about and Joel just read about is economic elitism, is economic elitism. Let me give you another form of elitism found in the Bible as a warning that the gospel breaks down, and it's found in Acts chapter 10. It's the story of Peter and Cornelius. If you know this story, just go with me. If you don't, let me tell it to you. There was a place in Caesarea, uh, an area of Israel at that time, and Israel was conquered by the Romans, so they had Roman soldiers there, and a centurion was over 100 men. And this was a centurion named Cornelius. And it says he was a God-fearing man. And that means that he believed a lot of what the Jews believed, but he didn't go all the way. He didn't go through all the ritual of circumcision and things like that, but he believed what they believed. He believed in one God. He believed in the laws of Moses, such and so forth. It says that he was a kind man, that he prayed, that he offered sacrifices to God, and that he gave, him, gave alms to the poor. And it said that God saw his heart and desired that he would come to know the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so at about in the afternoon, an angel appears to him and just startles him and calls him by name and says, Cornelius. And Cornelius says, what is it? He said, look, your prayers and gifts to the poor and offering to God. Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to a place and find a man named Peter. And Peter is a man that will come and tell you what I want you to know. He's in Joppa. Go to Joppa, find Peter, and you will know what to do. Now, it's interesting. Why doesn't the angel just tell him himself, look, here's the gospel. Here's who Jesus is. Here's what Jesus did. He doesn't do so because Peter needs to learn a lesson in how gospel is breaking down the barriers between people. And so at the same time, Cornelius sends three people to go find Peter. Peter the next day is up on the roof, and he's up on the roof praying, and all of a sudden there's this vision, as it were, and the sheet lowered with animals, all sorts of unclean animals. In the Old Testament, there were animals that Jews could eat and couldn't eat, uh, certainly pigs being one they couldn't, and scorpions and all sorts of things. But it was lowered down, and a voice from heaven said, Peter, you take and eat. And Peter, thinking this was a test, said, God forbid, Lord, I've, I've never eaten unclean food. And God really rocks his world when he says, don't call anything unclean that I now call clean. And this happened three times. Three times. And when it left, Peter was confused, and the Holy Spirit said, look, three men are coming for you. You go with them. And so they come, and they say, we want you to come, and Peter goes with them. They go to the house of Cornelius, and and Peter says to Cornelius, look, you know it's forbidden for me, a Jew, to cross over your threshold because you are a Gentile. It's illegal for me to do that. It's forbidden me to do that. But God has shown me that I can't call anything unclean that God now calls clean. So why am I here? And then Cornelius tells him the story of the vision that God had spoken to him. Go get Peter. And then in chapter 10, verse 34, Peter says this, I see now, I now see very, very clearly that God knows shows no partiality. I now see very clearly that God shows no partiality. He preaches the gospel. He talks about the judgment of God, but the freedom that is given through Jesus Christ, a forgiveness of sin, that is the gospel of Christ. That you are guilty before a holy God, but the same God who must judge you also gave you a way of relief in the sending of his son in the form of a savior, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. 
They hear the gospel, they receive the Holy Spirit, and Peter is amazed. He's amazed that even the Gentiles believe. You gotta understand, a Jew would thank God every day that he wasn't a Gentile dog. Every day he would thank God for that. And here God has even opened the door to the Gentiles. Well, Peter goes back to Jerusalem, and there's a group of boys there that aren't happy with him. There are Judaizers who think, yeah, it's okay for Gentiles to believe in Jesus, but they've got to become Jewish. They've got to come all the way, circumcision, Yom Kippur, keeping all the feasts and fasts, doing everything. And they're angry at Peter. They're angry at Peter because they went to them and said, look, when they heard this, they, they had no, oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. They said, look, you went to the house of a Gentile and you ate with them an uncircumcised man, and you ate with him, you ate with him. Why would you do such a thing? And so Peter in Acts 11 tells the whole story all over again that they received the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. And then Acts 11, 18, the whole church is starting to get it now. The Jewish church is understanding that God is doing a new thing. Don't call unclean what God calls clean. When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Now imagine how startled they were, even to Gentiles. You see, we've seen that the gospel is breaking down walls of economic elitism. It also is breaking down the walls of racial elitism. It's breaking down walls of racial elitism. Mahatma Gandhi, in his autobiography, talks about how he was contemplating becoming a Christian when he was a young man. He had read the gospels. He saw the freedom of Jesus Christ. He saw the love of Jesus Christ, and he saw how the caste system of India was keeping people enslaved. And so one day he decided to go to a church, and after the service, talk to the pastor about how he may become a Christian. But Gandhi entered a white church. When he went into the white church, one of the ushers greeted him at the door and said, whoa, 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 you're in the wrong church. Your church is up the road. And Gandhi left and said to himself, so if there is a caste system also in Christianity, I might as well stay a Hindu. And he never again entered the church. Is that not tragic? How racial elitism kept someone from hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We at MAFC, we don't want racial elitism. We want everybody to feel welcome because as I will show you, we have equal footing at the foot of the cross. The Bible condemns and breaks down the walls of cultural elitism. Now we understand that cultures have their differences. We understand that what might be impolite in one culture is accepted in another culture. We understand that different cultures might have different religions and different ways of seeing right and wrong and different way of, ways of handling situations. We understand that cultures are different, but that doesn't make one culture better than the other or should be looked down upon. I think, for example, in, in Japanese cultures, there's a tendency towards quiet, respectable behavior, while in Italian cultures, they're just very dynamic and charismatic, and the two of them together might not quite understand each other, right? But understand that we need to understand how people think and why in order to get to know them. In John chapter 4, Jesus meets a woman that's not of his culture, the woman at the well. Now, I love the story. The story says that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He had to go. Now, interestingly enough, most people go around Samaria, Jews. They wouldn't go through Samaria because Samaritans had adopted some of the rituals of the Jews, but they also adopted pagan rituals. And so they weren't seen as true Jews. But Jesus, having gone through Samaria, sits at a well to refresh himself. The apostles have gone to buy food in town, and a woman comes to the well in the middle of the day. Lots of speculation as to why. Why didn't she go in the morning? Because maybe she was one of those people that weren't even accepted by her own culture. So even within her culture, there was elitism as well. And Jesus asks the woman for a drink. He asks the Samaritan woman for a drink. And in 4 verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it you, that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. A long line of struggle between them. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. 
Jesus just looks at her and he gets right to the heart of the issue. He answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. They have a discussion about theology. Jesus claims he's the Messiah. He tells her things about his life that she wouldn't know. He wouldn't know otherwise. She goes and tells the town, come see the man who told me everything I did. And the Samaritans come out and Jesus stays. And many people from Samaria, that place that no Jew would want to go to, suddenly becomes followers of Jesus Christ. Because God breaks down the walls of cultural barriers in the gospel. We had a couple that had been gone about six months, Jeff and Karen. They were from Alabama. They had never come north before, and I could only imagine the trepidation of living with us Yankees. And so soon after they were here, uh, we invited them, my wife and I did, for a tour of Princeton, and we sat together and we talked to each other. Fascinating people. Uh, they live in Tornado Alley in Alabama. Jeff and Karen have experienced some 40 tornadoes in their lifetime. Uh, their deep roots in, in the Baptist church, and he used to kid that there was a Baptist church on every corner. We, we really tried to make them feel welcome. Every Sunday would ask, how are you doing? And other of you in the church made them feel welcome. And the last day they were here, I said to Jeff, Jeff, how has your experience at our church been? And he said, Pastor Brian, I'm ready to go back to my church in Alabama and say, guess what? The love of Christ is there in the north as well as the south. He couldn't have said anything more dear to my heart because the gospel breaks down cultural barriers. The gospel also breaks down barriers of religious elitism. Religious elitism. In Luke 18, there's this parable and Jesus tells the parable. He says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. There were some who trusted in their own righteousness, who paraded their own righteousness for everyone to see and treated others with contempt. And then he tells the story that two men went into the temple to pray. And one was a Pharisee who kept some 300 rules every day. And he prayed to God, really to himself, Lord, I thank you that I'm not an adulterer and that I'm not a cheat and that I'm not like that man over there, that tax collector, the lowest of lows that I... I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of everything I have and Lord I thank you for who I am I thank you for that and Jesus went on to say that the tax collector could not even raise his head to heaven because he knew that he'd been wrong in overcharging usury against his own people and he said Lord God have mercy on me the sinner the sinner and then Jesus startled the world when he said I tell you the second man not the first man went away forgiven. For he who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbled himself will be exalted. There's no room for self-righteousness, and we'll see why at the foot of the cross. There's no reason for you to think yourself as better than anyone else. You're different, but that doesn't make you better. We have educational elitism. If I have a doctorate degree and you only have a high school degree, I'm better than you but not in the church, not at the foot of the cross. And I'm really thankful for you doctors in our church. You correct us when we call you doctor in church. You want to make sure that you're on the same plane as we are. And I thank you for that. I thank you for many of you are experts in your field, but in church, you're just one of the boys. You're one of the family. You're one of the team. I thank you for that. Sadly, there's been gender elitism where men have been superior to women as well. The gospel breaks those all down, but I want to talk to you for a few moments about why elitism and partiality are wrong. And they're tied right back into the gospel and the scriptures themselves. First of all this, partiality, elitism, is contrary to God's character. It's con contrary to God's character. Impartiality is an important attribute of God. It is absolutely and totally impartial in dealing with people. He's absolutely and totally impartial in dealing with people. Now, I have a friend who wears a T-shirt, and he wears it for fun, and here's what it says. Jesus loves you, but I'm his favorite. And he wears it for fun. You know, he loves you, but I'm his favorite. But he knows it's not true because Jesus loves his children all the same. We read in Deuteronomy 10, 17, one of many places, for the Lord your God is a God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, mighty, 
and awe-inspiring God showing nor no partiality. Over and over again in the Bible, in Ephesians 6, God shows no favoritism. God shows no partiality. Don't think you can just keep sinning any way you want and say, ah, God's in heaven saying, boys will be boys. His justice will not let you do that. God shows no partiality. Partiality, treating people differently, is contrary to the character of God and therefore contrary to the character of God's people. Secondly, partiality is contrary to God's grace. It's contrary to God's grace. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Do you understand there is equality at the foot of the cross? We all have the same dilemma. We are sinners before a holy God. We all have the same remedy. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior of the world, died in our place on that cross for our sin. We all have the same solution that we received the grace of God by faith, that we would trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ for our salvation, for our eternity, that we would do that. That we would be, as Romans chapter 3 says, understanding this, there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are all justified freely by His grace through the redemption. That means the payment, the buying back that came by Jesus Christ. We all have sinned, equal problem, equal penalty, equal redemption, equal salvation. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, meaning he paid the penalty so that we could be at one with God through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith, to be received by faith. Faith is God's plan for all of us through grace. So partiality is contrary to God's grace. Thirdly, partiality is contrary to God's plan. It's contrary to God's plan because Christ came to tear down walls with, between people and not build them up. Christ came to take the dividing wall, it says in Ephesians 2, between Jew and Gentile, slave and free, and break that wall down so that all of us could have access, be in the same family, his church, and love one another in Jesus' name. Paul would say to the Ephesians church after talking about the dividing wall, Jesus came and preached peace to you who were far away and preached peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father. We both have access by one spirit. Partiality is contrary to God's plan for the church. And lastly, heaven has no room for elitism. There's just no room for elitism in heaven we opened up with that passage talking about every trunk, every tribe. In Revelation chapter 5, there's a prayer and a praise for Jesus Christ, and it's this. Jesus, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Every tribe and language and people and nation. Look, for too long in our society, the philosophy was, look, we might have to live with them in heaven, but we're not going to eat with them on earth. Whatever your view was, whatever your bias was, God has called the church of Jesus Christ to unity and to be one. And I'm thankful that I see that here at MEFC. I'm so thankful for that. All right. We see that it's a dilemma. We see it's against the plan, the grace of God. We see all that. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? I think we need to get beyond just anger. We get, need to get beyond caring enough to make a difference. And the church can start with the church and keep doing what the church is doing. But let me just give you some ways that it's helped me and I hope help you, help you to deal with your, your bias, uh, to deal with your, your elitism, uh, to deal with your partiality. Let me just give you some things that I think are helpful if you're willing to look into your own heart and look at your actions. First of all, be aware of your own biases. Some of us have had very bad experiences with people of a certain race. Uh, some of us have been taught that if we have enough education, we can look down upon other people. Uh, some of us have been taught by the culture that we were raised in that if we were a woman, we weren't as good as a man. Be aware of the biases, the things that have come upon you, and the filters in which you may see life 
and realize those aren't gospel thoughts. They aren't freedom in Christ. And examine why do you believe the way you believe. You may have been hurt by a certain group of people, a certain culture, a certain race, but the American Indians have an expression that I like. If one dog bites you, do you hate all dogs? Doesn't seem very logical, does it? So be aware of your own biases and why you have them. Secondly, strive to see that differences don't mean better or worse. Uh, there are differences. There are different languages. There are different ways of seeing uh, the way we behave. Uh, there's different ways of, of all sorts of things in different cultures. But that doesn't make them good or bad. When I was a missionary in Romania, I learned so much from the Romanians about how to love their families and how family was so important, so much even more important than here in my culture where people don't keep in touch the way they should. Strive to see the differences don't mean better or worse, it's just different. Third, communication is the key. I listened to a great presentation by Tony Evans, the pastor of the Urban Alternative in, in, um, in Texas, and and he said, look, you don't need another seminar. You just need to find some people that aren't just like you, and you need to invite them over, and you need to talk to them. And you need to say, tell me about your life. I find this to be wonderful. Tell me about your life. And you find out what people have been through, what people have gone through. And you say, man, that has not been my life. How did you do that? How did you work through that? And you find how hard some people have worked to get where they are, and the price that they've paid, and the the price their parents paid to get them where they are. And you begin to appreciate what people believe and why they believe it that way. See, communication is the key. We need to invite people over. Look, if you're not in a small group, you need to get in one. Because that's how we get to know each other. We've had people from different cultures in our small groups since we've been here. It's been fun. It's been great to learn from one another. You need to get into a small group. You need to share your life one on another. You need to do that. And finally, this may not make sense at first, but let me share it with you. You need to pick up your broom. You need to pick up your broom. Here's the illustration to back that up. John Wooden was the winningest basketball coach in NCAA history. He won 10 national championships over a 12-year period. Six years, he was called the coach of the year. He won the NBA championship seven years in a row. He was also a Christian. And when he openly testify about what Christ had done in his life, he had many pithy statements he would share with people. Here's just one of them. It's what you learn after all, you know it all that counts. Isn't that great? It's what you learn after you know it all, after you think you know it all that counts. He did many things. He was a great man in many people's eyes, but he simply wanted to be called coach. And here's where the broom illustration comes in. With all those national championships, guess what John Wooden was found doing weekdays when the lights and the cameras were off and the crowds weren't there? He would take a broom out of the janitor's closet and he would sweep the gym floor before his players got there. And when his players got there, they would realize that the coach was humble enough to serve them. When I say take up your broom, I mean, look, find out ways you can serve people. Find out ways you can get on the same team with other people that aren't just like you and getting to know your people. Every day of your life, serve somebody. Take out your broom. Use it. And show the world that you're not better than anybody. For Jesus Christ himself said, the greatest among you shall be your what? Shall be your servant. Shall be your servant. Look, we're angry right now, okay, but let's do something about it. I don't know if we can change our world, but we certainly can impact the people around us and certainly make positive improvements and keep moving forward as a church family. Understand, the world is not the church. No matter what barriers, differences, or distinction the world tries to place on us, in Jesus we are one. No matter our race, our views on things, our wealth or lack of, our jobs, any of these things. If you are in Jesus, you are a believer. If you are saved through Jesus, then you are my brother or sister. You just are. In Jesus, we are one. Through Jesus, we are one. Because of Jesus, we are one. In Jesus, through Jesus, because of Jesus, 
We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Let's pray. Father God, I want to thank you for the the wonderful truths we've learned that the gospel breaks down barriers, all kinds of barriers, economic barriers, racial barriers, cultural barriers, the barriers of self-pride and religion, and allows people together to love one another as we have been loved by Jesus, as we have been loved by Jesus. We want to thank you for the gospel. We want to thank you for the spirit. We want to thank you for the promises and the grace of God. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.